Hello, today is October 29, 2013. We're meeting with Mr. Ken Curry at his home in Loveland, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Ken, and thanks for sitting down to tell your story today. Thank you very much. Let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you're born, a little bit about your, uh, your family. Yeah, I was born in Los Angeles, uh, July 6th, 1945. Um, and I was born in California Hospital, downtown Los Angeles. Um, I grew up for the first five years, uh, sort of close to downtown Los Angeles, and then moved to Westchester. That's my hometown, which is a, not a separate town or city. It's part of Los Angeles, but it is a uh, an area right near the Los Angeles International Airport. Oh wow! And uh, just uh, actually, the airport is in Westchester. <laughs> Truth be known, uh, the zip code just on the other side of the airport to the south is the same as Westchester. So. Um, and I was, uh, grew up there and went to Westchester High School and graduated in, uh, February of 1963. That's a little interesting. Somebody would say, well, why yeah, February? Yeah. Well, in those days in Los Angeles, uh, they had such a tremendous amount of, of, uh, kids, uh, baby boomers oh, yeah. okay. after the war that they didn't know what to do. So they decided we better split the classes up. So they had a February graduation and a June. So I started school in February. And so I ended up graduating years later from high school in February. Huh. <laughs> and uh, coincidentally, I just had my 50th high school reunion just two weeks ago. <laughs> so that's a bit of interesting thing. And it was a wonderful time, just a wonderful time. Um, so, what else? Brothers and sisters? Oh yeah, I have one brother, uh, Tom, who lives in Aurora, Colorado, and uh, no sisters. Um, my parents, uh, my dad was a native of Los Angeles, which is kind of unique, especially for his generation. Because yeah. he'd say, they, people would ask him, where are you from? And he'd say, Los Angeles, that's where I was born. And they whoa, you know, because <laughs> there weren't that many yeah, in those right, days. Yeah, right. So my mother came from Chicago. Um, and they met at a church dance, and then I came along. Yeah. And my mother was a registered nurse. And my dad was a, uh, for 34 years, was an independent insurance, insurance agent and broker. So I grew up with my dad's office in the home uh, for a large part of the time until I probably got maybe 12 years old, 11 years old, and then he finally moved out into a, into a separate office. And that was the environment I grew up in. And uh, literally, my childhood, if you could characterize my childhood, uh, I would re reference Ozzy and Harriet, the oh, television really? yeah. show, uh -huh. because that is the way it was. I mean, it was the most, I mean, ideal kind of scene. You know, you, you had your friends in your neighborhood, and you played outside, and it was safe, and you went to school, you walked, and you didn't have to worry about any crime or anything. I mean, it was quite remarkable to be alive in those days. And I still reflect on that because wow. yeah, things have really changed. Yeah. But, so, um, yeah, grew up in this sort of ideal setting, you know, and neighbors were all friends and they all had kids. And, you know, we played outside and it was just a great time. What um, was uh, Los Angeles like then compared to now? I mean, much different. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, literally this town of Westchester it really wasn't a town. It was just a name place, you know, but, but it was like a little a little town. Mm -hmm. It had a main street, which was Sepulveda, which went right over to the airport. And there, there was not a lot around it, you know. I mean, downtown was only 10 miles away, but it just wasn't developed yet. It was still pretty wide open spaces, even around my high school. So it was a, it was big city, but it wasn't big city. You know, you yeah. were sort of a, a small town atmosphere. Uh. Um, and yet you still had the... Still had the big city right there. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, yeah. I consider myself a big city guy. Yeah, okay. Still to this day. So, uh, we you had talked about uh, when we talked earlier off camera uh, about growing up near the airport and, mm -hmm. and such. That sounded very fascinating, interesting. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it was because uh, you know going to going to high school, um, particularly. Well, let me tell you this too. This is another tidbit. I I went to junior high school at Orville Wright Junior High School. At, you know. Now I think about that, I go, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, Orville Wright Junior High is where I went to junior high school, which was middle school, now is middle school. Yeah. Then I went on to high school, and the high school was only about a mile and a half from the runways at the airport. <laughs> so you could hear occasionally, and it wasn't as many jets in those days, but there was some. 
So you could hear the jets a lot of times. And then, of course, the school was only a mile from the ocean. And seagulls flying over the lunch area outside, you know, they we used to call them flying toothpaste tubes because <laughs> they'd poop on you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, going through high school, um, I had one teacher who, who had been in the Air Force and who loved airplanes, and he took us on a field trip over to um, the airport, me and, like, three other guys, and we got to go in an airplane and sit in the cockpit. I mean, it was really cool. And then also as a kid, my parents would take us over to a place, uh, and this is in the history books, um, it was called Mike Lyman's Flight Deck, and it was a restaurant. Uh -huh. And it was on a second story, and it overlooked kind of the ramp area, but you could also see the airplanes taking off and landing. And they had a little uh, recorder there, and my parents wanted both of us to... It was sort of like the video camera of the day, but it was real <laughs> archaic. And so they wanted me to record my thoughts, and that's what I said, actually. I said, oh, this is so fun. I, I'm seeing the airplanes taking off and landing in. <laughs> that's the way I said it. I still remember it, because they played it back for me at some point. So anyway, growing up there, you know, close to that, sure, had a big impact on me. And then my home was right above the Hughes Aircraft Company, which Howard Hughes, you know, and he was famous in those days as well because he was doing all kinds of aerospace and aeronautical things and developing different things on aircraft, helicopters. And this place was just down the hill from where I lived. And I would play in a vacant lot at the top of the hill, we call it the canyons, and we would go down into the canyons, which went down to a road which fronted the Hughes Aircraft property. But we wouldn't go down there very often because they had security that used to drive around even then. But we could overlook it, you know, and we'd see, and they had an 8,000 foot runway, which is now, now not there anymore, but airplanes would come in there and land all the time. So we could go down to the, to the canyons or the lot, and uh, we'd play down there a lot and just do different things, you know. Um, and see the airplanes. So not only was I close to them at the high school, well, we were basically I was between the two airports. Yeah. So, wow. And you know, it, it was just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, going further, one of my first uh, real jobs was selling an afternoon newspaper at gate two, which was the main gate, if you can imagine, of Hughes Aircraft Company. So what did that mean? Well. In those days, you know, they all had badges, even they, they had security because it was a secure place and they had, you know, some secret stuff going on. But everybody would come to work at, what, eight in the morning and then they, or, or seven or six, and then I would go there after school at 3.30, pick up my big bundle of uh, papers, and I sold uh, the Herald Examiner's afternoon paper. Those days, newspapers were morning and afternoon. Okay. And I competed with a guy who sold the LA Times paper, which was called The Mirror. And mine was called The Herald Express. And we would literally, I think I was the last generation to do this, we would call out the headlines as the guys oh, wow. left the, the, the plant. And the papers were a dime. 10 cents. And I still remember to this day, one of the guys would always come out the gate with the dime sitting on his finger and walk along with it and then hold it out to me as I get this paper. <laughs> Some of those memories, I mean, where do you get those? Yeah, yeah right, but, yeah. But anyway, yeah, there we were, working right there and meeting some of the people, you know, that worked on the airplanes and, oh yeah, it was, it was wild and it was very, you know, safe and all that. So, um, that's a little bit about my yeah. my childhood. My oh, well, it sounded wonderful. Growing yeah. up, it was, it was pretty amazing. And needless to say, I, I assume that situation led to uh, what you eventually got into when we get into your military. Well, it did. It just had a huge impact. Uh, and there was just a couple of other things that, that, that had a bearing on that. I had a neighbor who was older than me that I used to play with a lot. And he was interested in airplanes. And so uh, I began... I was interested too, yeah. and I used to buy plastic models and build those, but he wanted to go further. He wanted to build a glider, so he did, and I helped him. Um, we, built a, uh, a, we built a pretty, not a real big glider at first, and uh, we would sail it down with that vacant lot. And we'd tow it. We'd tow it up, you know, run with it, 
and it would go up like a kite <laughs> and then we we could release it and it would it would soar around over the lot well we got a little carried away because we did a couple of things um, that were crazy. He found a military glider, a target glider. This thing was huge. I mean, it was huge to us, you know. We were teenagers. Uh, you know, the wingspan was probably four feet. That's pretty big. Well, one day we towed this thing uh, down at the lot, and it decided to go down to the huge aircraft company. <laughs> And they confiscated it. <laughs> we ran. We didn't want to get caught. <laughs> the other thing we did, which is absolutely crazy, and this is great, great history too, is he bought a military kite. It was a target kite. It was about six feet tall and about four feet wide. And we had to get heavy cord. And we put the, we <laughs> we put this thing up and flew it. And and we he got so much cord or string. It was more than strength. Uh, we, we got it so far away, we couldn't even see it anymore. <laughs> Somehow the line got tangled because it was sagging and we lost the kite. But it was an army target, you know, uh, target kite wow. that they used. So isn't that crazy? Yeah, I mean, you yeah. have those crazy, uh, crazy yeah. memories about things like that. But, yeah, uh, yeah. but again, related to aviation, sure. sort of. Yeah, um, right, right. You know, uh, airfoil, you know, the whole thing. Uh -huh. And up in the sky and... Uh, so that's kind of, I got really kind of tuned into it. So, um, where do we go from there? Then well, okay, so we'll uh, take your story. You, you graduate from high school. Uh, where do you go from there? Graduate from high school. Uh, I was about a, you know, C plus, B minus student. I wasn't, you know, wasn't really up the, you know, top achievers, but um, I didn't know what to do. So I went to Santa Monica City College, junior college. That's, that was what it was called then, Santa Monica City. It's, it's still there, uh, but it doesn't have the city name. And I went there for two years and just didn't have a direction at all. Didn't know what I wanted to do, didn't know. So, but I decided that kind of liberal arts, you know, uh, I thought about business, but I was really lost. And I was really into surfing in those days. I started surfing when I was 13. Wow. Um, it was the early days of surfing. You know, I was one of the early guys. Uh, not the very earliest, because there was guys that definitely... You know, started in the 40s, but this was, uh, what, this was 58, 59. And uh, it took me about a year to learn how to be comfortable out there, literally. Um, I mean, it was not easy. Yeah. Surfing's not easy. Yeah. And uh, I remember sitting out there sometimes when I was trying to learn, and I'd just be sitting on the board, and all of a sudden I'd fall off. <laughs> <laughs> so that was all going on. So I got real distracted from school when I went to Santa Monica. I didn't really focus on doing a great job. I mean, I did all right, but I was into surfing. I used to drive down the beach all the time. And, you know, that whole scene was another scene. And sure. that was that was the early days of, of surfing, you know. Um, so I spent a lot of time doing that. And then I got to the end, close to the end of the two years. Well, about a year and a half in, I knew that I better get my act together because I was not, I didn't get a lot of good grades. I was definitely kind of a, just a C not much better in this, this junior college thing. And um, I don't know, something got into me and I, I realized, hey, you know, and I think it wasn't my parents, it wasn't, they had certainly had an influence on me, but I kind of thought to myself, you gotta get, you gotta get it together here. You know, the clock is ticking. <laughs> and if you wanna be successful with anything, you better start putting your head down and getting to work. Hmm. Wow. And so one of my neighbors down the street had gone to Woodbury College, which was a, a private school in Los Angeles. It was actually founded about the same time as USC was, so it had some history. And it was uh, the school was and still is to some degree aimed at business and professional arts. And I wasn't an artist; I was definitely going for the business side. So that all came together, and that's where I ended up going. And they they allowed me credit for some of my. Uh, courses that I'd taken at Santa Monica, but not all the courses because the grades weren't that good yeah, and some yeah. of them didn't apply. Yeah. So I kind of had to start over, but the great thing about it was that Woodbury was on a quarter system, so I could jump in there and I could be out uh, in about two and a half years uh, more of school. So I had to go about a half a year, roughly a little more than half a year, almost a whole year extra, as it turned out. 
So that's where I went to undergraduate school and got my Bachelor of Science degree in sales management. And, you know, having sold newspapers yeah. seemed kind of the right fit. My dad was a sold yeah. insurance and, yeah. you know, and I was real personable and friendly. And I'd, I'd been an officer in student government in school, both in junior high school at Orville Wright and then later in high school, uh, both times a couple different positions that I got elected to. and. So that was my school experience. I wasn't an athlete. My athlete part was surfing, which is pretty much a, you know, I didn't play any sports. I didn't, you know, I played baseball all through school, but not for the high school, you know, Little League, Pony League, mm -hmm. all that. Um, and that's another little piece of me. But so then, um, you know, I got about a year before graduation. And of course, in those days, everybody was on a student deferment. Mm -hmm because the Vietnam War had started, what, in 65, 64, and they went into the, uh, the draft program, and you had to sign up, mm -hmm. and you got a draft number, and you, you know, and yet you applied for, if you were in college, uh, what they called a 2S student deferment. Mm -hmm. And the story was, about a, a year before graduating, you know, talking with my peers, people were saying, well, I'm going to, you know, a few were saying, I'm going to go to Canada and get out of here. And that actually did happen with a few people, not a lot. But then others were saying, well, I'm going to get married or I'm, I'm going to marry my girlfriend before graduation so I can get a deferral of my uh, draft. Mm -hmm. that They were allowing that. If you were married, they would allow it for a while. Um, didn't last the whole time. But And then the other people would say, yeah, I'm, I'm, my, I'm already married and I'm going to get my wife pregnant, so I really don't have to go. And they, that was a real solid deferral, you just got out of it all together if you had a child. But if you didn't, like me, you were looking down the, you know, down the end of the road there as, you know, maybe being a foot soldier, you know, even with a college degree. I mean, what's going through your mind during this time when you've got all these different people talking about these different alternatives? I mean, what were you thinking? I mean, what was Well, that, that's what I'm going to tell you right now, okay. because what I thought was, okay, I'm doing well, I'm, I'm doing well in school. I mean, I was in the honorary scholastic fraternity. Wow. I put my head down. I guess so. I got wow. it together, yeah. and uh, and I was and I was loving it. You know, I was loving the challenge. I was. I used to. I realized that I needed to sit up front in the class. Really helped me because I'm easily distracted. I'm so interested in everything yeah. that's going on yeah. around me. But that did it. You know, get up to the front and pay attention and work hard. And so I did it. And I, I thought about a year before graduation, I knew I was going to graduate at that point. I didn't have any question that I was, you know, I'd already had a pretty good track record. So yeah. I didn't had a lot of confidence that I was graduating. So I thought, you know, I got to do something here. I got to, I don't want to be drafted. I, I want to serve the country as an officer. That's what I'd like to do. But you know what? I don't want to stay, I don't want to spend a lot of time at it. I'll do my duty yeah, yeah, yeah. and then yeah. get out. Yeah. So what did I think? Well, I thought, okay. Uh, and I looked at all of them. I looked at all four of them: Navy, Army, Marines, Air Force. Um, Army really didn't have any interest in that at all because that reminded me I was going to be a foot soldier. Yeah, yeah, or whatever. Right. Um, Marines, eh, same thing, sort of. You know, eh, uh, you know, I wasn't a fighter really. Uh, so I thought, okay, Navy, yeah, this is cool. Three years active duty, and I'm out. I'm home. I'm free. And guess what? If I go to Vietnam, I'll be on a ship. Offshore, nice, clean food, you know, and I love the ocean because yeah. I'm a surfer. Right. And so I thought, this is it. I want to go in the Navy. So I went downtown in those days, just to show you how the world has changed, you know, the recruiting office, even though I lived in, you know, there was no recruiting offices out in where I was. You had to go downtown. Main Street in Los Angeles. You know Los Angeles, that's, that's a pretty, like, not a real safe area even today. It wasn't that either. But that's where, that's where the recruiting office was. So I went down, went to the Navy, signed up, said, I'm going to the Navy. Now, you, you were signing up, but you had to take the test, you know, uh -huh. first. Uh -huh. So um, they said, okay, well, here's your testing date. Come on down. This is, again, still about a year before I was going to graduate. So I went down, took the test. Um, and they called me and said, you failed. <laughs> I said, what? What 
what did I fail? What part, you know? Well, you know, Ken, you, you did okay on the math part. And here's what you need to know is really that I was always an English guy. I wasn't a math guy. I did well in, in English. That, that was my, yeah. if there was one thing I was good at, it was English, you know, reading and literature and writing, and, but not math. So I passed the math part and the guy says, and you failed the English part. I said, what? <laughs> I did? Well, I just, I was, I was in a pile at that time. <laughs> you know, I just was just, it, I, I recovered. It didn't take me too long, but, but it only took me a couple weeks. But I, I was really depressed and I felt like, oh man, that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> and I was mainly thinking about the time in active duty, so you yeah, know, how yeah, good yeah. it was going to be. I was going to be a line officer, you know, and I liked the Navy uniform and all that, you know. Anyway, so about three weeks, as I remember, went by. Uh, two weeks at least, and then I picked myself up. I feel like that's what I did. I kind of pulled myself back up and said, okay, where is the next one? And it's going to be the Air Force. There was no question. No question, because I already ruled out those other two. Yeah. And so I decided, okay, i got to go downtown and walk into the Air Force recruiter's office and just see what I can find out, because I'm going to see what I can do. So I went in and told my story, pretty much like I just told it right now. And... You know, it's funny because when I walked in the door, I still remember to this day, and I looked across the room at a guy sitting at a desk who was, who was the recruiter that helped me, and he was an African-American guy, and he just had this big smile on his face, and he, he was a sergeant, and he got up and he greeted me, you know, and he said, come on, sit down here, you know. I mean, it just gives me goosebumps to think about it, because I, already then I felt like, hey, you know what? I think I found it. <laughs> And this guy was so encouraging and started asking some questions, you know, like we just covered here. Where did you grow up? Yeah. And I told that story. And he said, well, he said, you're not, I'm not going to let you just take the officer test. He says, you're going to take the test for pilot training. And I said, what? And he goes, well, yeah, let me ask you a few more questions. And I told him, he asked about model airplanes and where I grew up and just <laughs> wow. stuff that I just covered. Yeah. And uh, he said, that's it, done deal, you're taking it, you're, you're, you're done, you know, uh, and here's your date, and, you know, I think you'll do great, you know, and a lot of encouragement. So I walked out of there kind of on a cloud nine, um, really thinking that, that I had made, things were coming together. <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with the Navy thing. Just, <laughs> yeah. And um, went down, took the test, and it didn't take but a few days, he calls me up at home and uh, he says you passed and you're going to pilot training <laughs> I said what <laughs> he says yeah you got you got a 95 on the test officer test and you got 93 on the pilot part you're on your way <laughs> I said, he said I'll be calling you with a date so without giving you all the details uh, well I'll give this detail because it's kind of crazy but so I found out somewhere along the line there that a close friend of mine who I went to school with was also going to go in the Air Force at the same time, except he wasn't going to be a pilot because he didn't have the vision. He had to be 2020. Okay. And that was mandatory or better. And I was better. I was 2013 in one eye and 2015 in the other eye. And I kept that for many years, actually. And he, he and I, I thought we were going to go in together. So he was excited because now we didn't have to be Lone Rangers anymore. Well, it turns out I went on a vacation with my parents to Ensenada, Mexico, and I got the bug down there. And, and without giving all the details, I came back ahead of my parents and really got sick to the extent that I had to call my friend's dad, the same friend that I was going to go in the Air Force with, and say, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble here. you got to come on. And he was a doctor. Hmm. And he came over to my house and he said, if I didn't know you and I couldn't help you here, like, without hospitalizing you, I would be hospitalizing you right now because you're so dehydrated. So I had to call and say, hey, I'm sick. I got to defer. So we didn't go off together, although we did serve together at the same time, and we're still friends today. Mm -hmm. um, but my, mine was deferred to February. I was going to go on January 3rd, I think, and end up going like February or something, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and my, that was my training, officer training school class. And did, did you have to put off college in the uh, remaining segment of college? No, or? no, no. I finished. This, oh, was, did you? this was this was in. So I graduated. I didn't, didn't tell that. 
I graduated in November of 67. And this all happened then. I went on that trip in December. Oh, okay. okay. And so, see, this was a not quite a year, but it was about a year after I first went down to the recruiting okay. office. Okay. You know, so so I graduated November '67, got my bachelor of science degree. As I, you know, and I again, I didn't have any doubts that I would yeah. finish. Right. And went in the service then um, February, I think I don't remember February third or something like that. And went off to officer training school in San Antonio, Texas, and. Um, Pretty life-changing experience. <laughs> yeah, that's always one of the questions I always like to ask. I mean, how was that transition from civilian life into military life for you? Uh, well, it, it was it was huge, and um, it, it was. I'm 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 the kind of a person that is I I condition I I'm conditionable I'm I'm influenced pretty easily. I, I'm not one of these people that can just doesn't want to try things or doesn't want to and so man I got in there and I just <laughs> I became uh, right away I mean I just got into it you know they shaved all my hair off and you know it was crazy it was <laughs> crazy but it was a great great experience and I actually became an officer in basically the way officer training school works probably still did not then the it was 90 days your 90 day wonder they can mm -hmm. pop you out right. at the end as a second lieutenant um, but the first um, half of that, you're acting basically as an enlisted man. And you actually are a staff sergeant when you do the program. Um, and then the second half, you're an officer. So I, I actually got promoted to uh, one of the officers in the group. And uh, I was an OT captain, officer trainee captain. Um, I wasn't you know, right at the top or anything. but. Um, so that was pretty neat, and um, yeah, I, my parents came down to see me before I graduated, and they, they couldn't believe it. You know, I mean, I was squaring all my corners, and I was you know, <laughs> and I was holding rolls of nickels all the time in my hands. You know, I stood. I mean, I was like really into it. I mean, I was gone, <laughs> and I loved it though. It was yeah. it was a great. It was very challenging. It was very tough. And I mean that sincerely. I mean, we didn't get much sleep. I mean, I was getting, and I, I don't do well, um, five hours a night studying, you know, late, going to bed at 11, 30, 12, getting up at 5, 30. Yeah. That was, and it was a, it was a trial, you yeah. know, and we all were in it together and, you know, it was really something. So, and people from all over the country, guys like me, but guys from big name schools and every, you know, I was just, woo, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and then the, those the, are, those were flyers knew that they were going where they were going for pilot training. I mean, this was all done deal. It wasn't like they didn't think you weren't going to get out of, mm -hmm. you know, become an officer. That was just a given. Yeah. Uh, the pilot training was a different story, uh, but they you already knew, and I um, I knew I was going to go to Williams Air Force Base in uh, Mesa, Arizona, or actually outside of Phoenix. And, uh, and so I graduated, and I also had. Um, been dating in college some, and I dated a girl that I met who was a sister of my friend down the street who built those kites and <laughs> airplanes. And he married a girl, and his sister is the girl that I asked to marry me. Okay. Wow! Yeah. And part of it, part of it was uh, I didn't really want to be alone, and so I had. Asked her to marry me before I went into officer training school, and uh, we had set a date, May eighteenth, nineteen sixty-eight, uh, when when we knew that I would be home for uh, on leave after my officer training school, and I think they gave me thirty days uh, right away there. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and not because of being getting married. That's just what. They yeah, did. right. Yeah, you had to have travel time, you know, and mm -hmm. that to get to your base. And so I got married on May eighteenth. And uh, didn't do a military wedding, but but I was definitely Mr. Military at that point. <laughs> and off to pilot training, and won't give you all those details, but we you know went over to Arizona, found a place to live, and came back, and you know they moved everything, and uh, got a little apartment. And uh, of course, you know you might think an officer was making good money, but you weren't making good money. It was terrible. I mean, it was just really pretty tight. <laughs> yeah, boy. Um, but then I began pilot training, and my gosh, you know, I didn't really have a clue how uh, intense that was going to be. Um, it was very challenging. Um, 
really challenging. Um, one, one of the most challenging things I think I've ever done. I mean, mm -hmm. it was definitely, uh, still to this day, it was the most challenging educational experience I've had. And, and I will tell you this now, I went back to school after the Air Force and got my master's degree. So I have a, yeah, right. a flavor of right. what it's all about to be in school. And um, you, you had mentioned when you were in college that uh, oh, you had no doubt you were going to graduate. Did you ever have doubts while in flight school or, or officer training school? That, that, uh, uh, a little bit in officer training school because I was having such a hard time with my uh, good question. Um, I had a hard time, you know, with not enough sleep. I need, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm a kind of guy that I just need about, you know, I need a decent night's sleep. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh my gosh, I was falling to sleep during lectures at the in officer training school, you know, and my notes, I remember to this day how crazy that is. You know, you'd be taking notes and, <laughs> you know, you crash out and you got, you know, you force yourself to stay awake. So yeah, there was a little bit of doubt there, but I made it fine. Yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, it's funny because I think one of the keys for me was that guy that recruited me, that encouragement that he gave me, those questions mm. that he asked me, made me realize that I had this, this was sort of my destiny, yeah. you know? I mean, I grew up by these airports yeah. with these, all this airplane stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I had no reason to do that for my dad or anybody yeah, else, but yeah. there I was. And so I had an element of confidence that I look back on now and I, I don't, I think that's really what never made me really doubt that I was going to make it, even when things got a little tough at times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had, a, the pilot training class had an outrageous attrition rate. Um, we started out with about 120 guys, roughly, um, in the pilot training class, and um, we graduated 66. So it wasn't easy, All right? Yeah. And I was amazed at how some of the guys did. Some of the guys really did well, and I ended up graduating in the bottom fourth of my class. I wasn't at the rock bottom, but I was down in the bottom quarter. Um, but I but I graduated, you know. And I never really came close of getting booted. I never. I mean, I had a couple bad flights or a couple bad missions, but but um, I was never. I mean, it was it, there was a constant pressure. Let me put it that way. But I was never on the in the in the place where I was scared about being booted. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was doing good enough. Um, my attitude was good, and um, I worked hard. And um, you know, but uh, at the same time, my my life was really negatively influenced because my wife never found a job, and so we spent the whole year in pilot training, and I was the only income provider. She sat at home and really didn't do anything. I don't know what she did <laughs> uh, to this day. Um, and I'll tell the rest of that story in a minute. But, um, we, you know, we were doing all right. I mean, we were, yeah. didn't have any problems per se, right. but it was just a real letdown. Because she'd been a medical assistant, and so I really expected that she would get a job and have some income, you know, for her and something to do. Yeah. Never did anything. So, anyway. Um, so, pilot training um, started out in the T-41, which is a Cessna 172 today, a little single-engine airplane. Um, a lot of attrition there because uh, well, people would get sick, get air sick. I never got air sick. Hmm. Um, you know, remember, we're flying in Arizona and pilot training in Arizona, and I started pilot training in June. Okay, um, so June to June, 53 weeks. Yeah. Uh, most people know what it's like in Phoenix in June, and it doesn't end. Yeah. <laughs> Even in the middle of winter, it's not very nice. You know, I mean, it's okay. It's a beautiful place, yeah. but it still gets hot yeah. and a lot of turbulence. And so, so the guys would wash out and started washing out, and um, it was sad. It was sad to see them go. They just mainly the air sickness, or they just couldn't do it. You know, they just didn't have the coordination or the wherewithal to fly an airplane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of them went on to nav school. You know, some of them, I don't know, some of them just were regular officers, you know, they were already committed at that point. Uh, my commitment was a year of pilot training and then four years of active duty, okay? Um, then we graduated from that, I graduated from the T-41, which which was great, and I soloed and all that, that's what, I, you know, and I had never been, I never had my hands on it. Right, anymore. right, okay, never, yeah, yeah. Never. I mean, I'd done all this other stuff, yeah, yeah. but I've never flown. Now, some of the guys had flown, see, 
some of the guys had quite a bit of time, actually, or at least done it for fun with yeah, their parents right. or something, not me. So then on to T-37s, which was a little twin-engine jet, side-by-side -side seating, um, and aerobatic, but not, not supersonic or anything, not real fast, but a great little airplane, and um, that was the next phase. And about a hundred, uh, about a hundred hours in the T thirty seven, and of course uh, the first, well, the whole year, the first three quarters of the year, you were both flying every day and you had academics every day. So you would, we would show up at like seven in the morning, seven thirty, and we'd get home a lot of times, you know, at seven thirty at night. So we had long days. We'd carpool. We used to carpool with other guys, and uh, out to the base, and we'd be there. Um, the schedule would rotate. Um, the academics would either be in the morning or in the afternoon, and it would vary. So some weeks or months or whatever, we'd be. Well, we I think we'd alternate actually. So we'd be flying some of the time in the morning. We'd start our day on the flight line, you know, in our in our in our squadron room, and um, um, go fly, and then go to school in the afternoon. And the school consisted of every facet of aviation. You know, we learned weather, um, the instrument flying, uh, academically, all these things, you know, all the systems on the airplanes and all the details about aerodynamics and high-speed aerodynamics, supersonic aerodynamics, and just on and on and on and on and on. Fascinating. And how did that work for you? Because you said your weakness was kind of in that area, the maths and stuff. Well, it really wasn't that math. You know, it was, I loved it. I oh, ate really? It up. Yeah, I ate it up. I, you know, I didn't really excel at it, yeah. but I, I was really interested in it. I, I really liked aerodynamics. I really liked some of the other stuff and, um, you know, just the theory of flying. Uh -huh. And, and uh, I had read a book before I went in when I knew I was going to pilot training. Um, called Stick and Rudder. Uh, Stick and Rudder still to this day is an amazing book. It was written by a German guy, Wolfgang von Langschwitz, okay? <laughs> but this guy talks about basic aerodynamics and flying, and he gave me a, a platform, see? I didn't, okay. So it gave me more confidence too, yeah, right. once I was there. So it was radical. Uh, it was a very tough life, and the, the single guys were out partying all the time meeting girls, chasing women, you know, me, I wasn't because I was married and I wanted, what pushed me into getting married really was, I, I didn't want to be alone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't a real single kind of guy, you know, I wasn't a real, even in high school, I mean, you know, I never got drunk in high school, I never threw up, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I liked, I loved girls and I liked to dance and I, I did that stuff, but I wasn't, you know, I just yeah. wasn't that kind of guy, I was right, more right, kind of yeah. guy, I want to have yeah. a little place, you know, yeah. <laughs> comfort and secure and place to go home to. And so that's, that was a contrast for me. And it was the same with the other married guys, you know. And of course, in those days too, uh, the word was almost right away, you heard, well, everybody in pilot training gets their wife pregnant. <laughs> well, that happened. So, oh boy. So my wife got pregnant and, um, um, you know, my daughter was born after I, I got out of pilot training, but she was uh, she was born in you know, Merced, California, at Castle Air Force Base, while I was in, still in training, um, advanced training at that point. Um, so, where was I going with that? I guess you know it was a great, great experience. I'll never ever forget it. I met wonderful guys from all over the country. That was the other fascinating part. Mm -hmm. Was just. You're mixed with all these guys yeah. from all these different yeah. cultures. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. All over the United yeah. States. Yeah. And it was terrific. You know, it was a what a learning experience, you know, and just to find out what their lives were like right. and and then be working with them and just and then some of the sad stories later on. <laughs> but <laughs> but it was great. So end of pilot training, um, give you a block of airplanes. Okay, that's what they call it. Still do, still do today. Um, you're given a block to your class, each class at each base. Now, there were a lot of bases then because of the war and everything. There's mm -hmm. not as many today. So you get a block. A block just meant a big list. Okay, And, of course, in pilot training, the big deal, and in the Air Force, the ego trip, the macho, was you got to be a fighter pilot. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I didn't ever have that burning desire because I'm a people person to this day, and I knew it even then. And it didn't really excite me. And I got plenty of exposure and experience at flying by myself, mm -hmm, you know, solo. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of our flying was solo. 
Um, great experience, gave you confidence. You know, you didn't have anybody to depend on, you had to do it. But I thought, you know, I don't really want to be doing missions in a fighter. I just, I mean, you know, and I, it, some guys thought it was weird because they, oh, you know, fired, you know, shoot them down and, you know, all this. And no, you know, I thought, I, I don't really want to do that. So when the block came down, uh, what they did is they took everybody in the hierarchy of the class standing. So they took the top guy, he gets first choice. First, they show you the block, and then you go back a couple days later, and then you do your choosing. Okay, so the top guy. Okay, they call out the name of the top guy, work their way down to the bottom guy. <laughs> And uh, all of us knew at that point we were graduating, and these were the assignments we were going to have where we did our next training and went on to fight the war, or whatever. Um, top guy surprised all of us. Um, he did not choose a fighter. Blew everybody's mind, of course. A lot of the macho guys thought he was crazy. And um, he choose, chose a C-130, which is a four-engine transport yeah. plane. Yeah. And, uh, and then um, they went on down, and they got down to me, and there was two airplanes left. Um, there was the B-52, and there was the KC-135. And I kind of, I looked at the block when it first came out, and I thought, well, you know, I think I'd like to have an airplane that had some crew on it, you know. And I, I wasn't really excited about a, a C-130 because it was a turboprop. I thought, you know, I want a jet, you know. I, I don't want a prop plane. Yeah. And so I got down there, had those two left. And I, there was no choice at all for me because I'd already decided I do not want to be a flying gas station. I, that has, I, that has, I have no interest in that whatsoever. I could care less, you know. And so I'm going to take the bomber. And I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I thought, sounds pretty good, you know. And it's big and it's, you know, it does a lot of different things. The mission is real diverse. And I don't have to sit up there just pumping fuel to people or transporting stuff, you know. I didn't want to be a... Um, 141 pilot, you know, transport, uh -huh. boring. <laughs> so I chose the 52, and I, and I made the right choice. Oh wow! Because I loved it. Wow. I just absolutely loved it, and it, it had a crew of six, including the, you know the, the pilot and co-pilot. And off I went to. Um, let's see, how did this work? First, I went to survival training. Oh wow! Talk a little bit about that. That's oh, yeah. fascinating. Yeah, I went to yeah went to survival training um, um, up in Spokane, Washington. Uh, at Fairchild Air Force Base, and wow, that was two weeks. Now remember, I said earlier my daughter was, or my daughter was born, actually when I was in survival training. Um, my wife had been pregnant through pilot training, and of course now we're, we're probably in what was it, July? Yeah, July, something like that. Uh, yeah, it's July, and I'm in the middle of survival school. I get the call. Uh, you have a baby girl. Wow. So I I went to the squadron commander in the survival school and said, you know, hey, my wife just had a baby. Can I go? The guy said, forget it. You got to finish survival school. You're not going. Period. Well, I figured, okay. There was no, uh, there was no argument. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was delivered like that. Yeah. You know? And I didn't, I didn't beg. I didn't push. I, yeah. you know, I just thought, okay, I got to let it go. So my, my daughter was born July 29th. It was the middle of my survival school training. In the second week in survival training, you do a lot of things. So you do what they call a trek, and you you have to use a compass, and you have you're doing you do it in a group, and then you do it with just another guy. You have to go cross country in the mountains up north of in northern Washington. There, it was an incredible experience. Mm. And then you get captured, and you experience uh, the whole uh, captured. Uh, process of interrogation and um, mm. you know lock up and, mm -hmm. and the first part you had was Vietnam modeled and the second part was uh, they were smaller but it was a model of Korea um, and then the third part was a model of World War Two and each each of those was different hmm. the way they handled pris yeah. prisoners so what it built in me was an absolute fear of um, being captured because I couldn't think of anything worse. <laughs> To me, I mean, literally, and I mean this, I mean, I've said this many times to other people, um, I, I was ready to die uh, for my country, but I did not want to be captured. Wow. That's, huh. just, that's just me. I mean, I just didn't, I didn't, want, I didn't want to do that, you know. I couldn't think of anything worse to be locked up and interrogated and abused. And um, I, I felt like, hey, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die, hmm. you know. 
And that comes back a little later in the story. But um, so that set the stage. And so then I got out of there and I uh, then I came back. And the next thing I had to do was go to uh, nuclear weapons school. And I went to nuclear weapons school in uh, Carswell Air Force Base in Texas. And um, I think that was the order I did it in. Um, and that was fascinating. I loved that. That was a whole different world. And, um, you know, we learned all about nuclear weapons and conventional weapons and the bombs. And, you mm -hmm. know, it was designed for B-52 people. Mm -hmm. You know, they were going to be dropping the bombs. And, you know, in those days, we not only had the Vietnam War, but we had the Cold War, too. So basically, I like to tell the story, and this is fairly recent. I didn't tell it that way then, but I realized, you know, my job was really fighting two wars. Um, because and when I tell you about that in a few minutes, uh, we had that Cold War, and then we had the Vietnam War, and they were all going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so that was great. Uh, came home, saw my baby, and then I went off to that, that uh, nuclear weapons school. Got my wife and my child moved to Merced, California, where I had uh, been assigned to go through B-52 training. So I went out to Castle Air Force Base, Merced. Um, got crewed up with a, a guy that had been um, a pilot for a number of years. He was a major. I was, you know, a first or second lieutenant still. Um, and uh, off we went. <laughs> and um, it was great. I, I, I liked it right away. I liked I liked the co-pilot role because it's a, it's a real, it's, you had to be really on top of things and you were a key person. You were actually the key person. <laughs> You ran out, kind of ran a lot of the systems, and you did the flight planning, and and, and I just absolutely ate it up. Mm. <laughs> so graduated from B fifty two training, got assigned to March Air Force Base, California. That's another interesting piece of my history. You know, some people scratch their heads and say, "How did you get pilot training, a seven hour drive from your hometown?" Oh, right. And then how did you? get March Air Force Base in Riverside, which is right there, yeah, right. you know, and your guy that's from L.A., you know. Well, I, I didn't have anything to do with it, yeah. you know, it's just the way it happened. Somebody did it, you know. So I was there for my whole career, really, was my, that was my home base. Yeah. I almost got transferred out of there in the middle of the time I was there to Dias Air Force Base in Texas, but I was able to, not of my own accord, I had a guy come up to me and say, hey, you know, I'm from Texas, would you be willing to trade orders with me because I'm staying here? And I said, you bet. Because yeah. <laughs> by that time I was established. So went to March. Um, uh, just another, my, my experiences were just, it's hard to believe. Um, I guess it was because I was working hard and trying to do my best. But uh, I started flying there. Um, with various aircraft commanders and different crews, they want to kind of get you indoctrinated and trained on the local stuff. And, and I flew with this one crew, and he approached me after a couple times, and he said, uh, we're an instructor crew, and I'd like you to be a co-pilot on my crew. Wow. And so I said, yeah, I'd love to. You know, and I loved all the guys, and, and loved flying with him. He was great. Um, and so I went on that crew, and so this was, uh, it was called an S crew, um, that was the designation. Uh, there was S, E, and I think R was the, yeah, R was the basic crew. So, and you still, it was a hierarchy. So the, the E crew was a little better quality, and then the S crew was the top of the, top of the book, you know, big, wow. okay. So, and this, the S standard for standardization and evaluation, okay. Um, Basically like the FAA today, so we were the flight examiners. Uh, I wasn't to start out with, but my whole crew was. They were all instructor pilots or instructor navigators, or okay. and I was just the greenie, you know. Um, so the guy in the left seat, my aircraft commander, was an instructor aircraft commander. So so I got wonderful training. Oh, yeah. Because these guys were the best. Yeah. And I'm on their crew. Wow. I, I didn't have... <laughs> I don't know. Well, that says something about you, though. I guess. You know, yeah. I mean, I never yeah. really took it that way. Yeah. I never got big-headed about yeah. it. But yeah. um, So, fast forward. Um, I, I went overseas. Um, actually, right before I went overseas, I got divorced. Um, I, I had started pulling alert with this crew, and, and um, alert was, uh, and I probably, I realize some people may be watching this think, what's alert? Well, basically, it's like being a fireman. 
That's the best parallel I can give you from yeah, the civilian right, okay, world. Okay. So you show up on Thursday morning at eight o'clock at the base, uh, and you check in at the end of the runway in the alert facility, and um, you are there for seven days. Okay. Wow. And you get out the Thursday morning, eight o'clock, the following week, and you cannot leave the base. You cannot go anywhere alone without the crew or some of the crew with you. Um, you can go to the movies, you can go to the base exchange, you can drive around the base a little bit because you have a vehicle. But, you know, you're, you're there to, to be ready to go in case of the nuclear war. Wow. wow. The airplanes are sitting on the ramp, the bombers and the tankers full of fuel, the airplanes have the nuclear weapons on board, wow. you're sitting in this um, alert shack, they called it, but basically it had two levels. One was underground. That's where the sleeping quarters were for, for good reason, you yeah. know, because if the base ever got attacked, you're, you're, under, you're in, uh, in concrete underground. <laughs> and then the eating and stuff is up on the main level in briefing room and all that. So you lived there for the whole week. Um, they, you know, you, you lived there. <laughs> yeah. And you could not go home. And so my wife ended up having an affair with a guy in in our, my apartment building, who was a high school teacher, and there was two guys, and they were buddies, and they were partiers, big partiers. And uh, she had an affair with him almost right away when we moved to, to you know, probably January of that year. And, uh, and I discovered it in like, I don't know, March, in a March. I caught her talking on, to him on the phone in a phone booth. Remember phone booths? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, she left me immediately, took my 10 month old. Hmm. Um, they moved to another apartment. I didn't, I didn't even know where it was. And uh, she moved out and took my baby and moved in with him. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. And I was pretty crushed. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I was pretty destroyed, even though I wasn't happy that she had never gotten a job and uh, whatever. Yeah. But, and this has an interesting end. Um, um, but so there I was alone. Um, and my crew then, uh, who's, who's, that was on that instructor crew, uh, my aircraft commander, you know, we got orders uh, to go overseas to be, basically the term today is deploy, we didn't use yeah. that. We were, we were TDY, TDY means temporary duty, mm -hmm. still does today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, for a strategic air command, that's what I was part of, okay, strategic SAC. And the strategic air command um, never deployed and again, I'm using today's word, okay. never sent anybody overseas on a uh, PCS move, permanent change of station. They sent you TDY, stood for temporary duty. Okay, the rules with temporary duty were very simple. They could have you over there 180 days, temporary duty. They had to bring you back at, before the 180 day point was reached. You had to come back to CONUS, okay, continental US, mm -hmm for 28 days or less, then they could send you back. Oh, home. geez. Okay, so that's why when I tell that part of my story, you'll understand why I was over there bombing three, three different times in total of about 14 months. Um, so I did not go on your usual, you know, oh, you, how many times you go to Vietnam? Yeah, yeah. One year, you yeah, know, or yeah. two years, yeah. you know, not me. I went over there three times for, you know, different periods of time. Um, so anyway, so I went overseas with my crew and um, I was pretty torn up, you know, with this marriage going down the tubes mm -hmm. and my baby and mm -hmm. all that. And my aircraft man was just great. He said, don't worry about it. He said, just tell me if you're having a hard day and I'll just keep an extra eye on everything and we'll just get it done and we're here to, you know, mm -hmm. we'll do whatever we can. And it turned out it was just great. And I, you know, those days you sent letters and uh, so, you know, I wasn't writing to my wife uh, at that point, but she was still my wife. Um, but I was writing to my parents and, you know, some of that communication. And so I came back. Uh, we flew 42 missions. Uh, did a lot of bombing of Cambodia when in those days. Uh, nothing's really changed. In those days, the president was saying, no, we're not bombing Cambodia. No, <laughs> not at all. Uh, but most, a lot of my missions were Cambodian. Um, no threat, uh, safe. It was pretty much a milk run. Okay. Uh, you know, 42 missions. 
Uh, I learned a tremendous amount, you know, because we would fly out of Guam. We flew out of three different places in those days, Guam, Okinawa, and Thailand. It was classic. I mean, I was one of the last, we were one of the last ones to fly out of Okinawa. Uh, I think about a month after we were there, maybe two months, they stopped flying out of there because there were so many protests uh, from the local population with the B-52s. Um, but I got that experience. So uh, Guam Mission, um, that's where we went first, uh, 24 hours door to door, uh, leave the quarters, uh, and uh, come back 24 hours later. Wow. Okay, so uh, mission time, 12 to 13 hours. Take off to landing, okay? Uh, air to air refueling, uh, almost pretty quickly after you took off, uh, top off the tanks. Um, the tankers would come out of Okinawa and we'd rejoin, you know, over the water somewhere. Uh -huh. uh, uh, three ship formation, three ship tankers. Uh, the rendezvous was just, even then, technologically, it was... Oh, pretty, that always fascinated me. It yeah. was pretty remarkable, yeah. <laughs> you know, because, uh, you know, we, we'd use the radar, they'd use their radar, they'd find us, then they'd go over us usually, and then come back, and then we'd come up to them and hook up, and we were on the, we were on the boom 30 minutes, uh, top off the tanks, and it was a must-do out of Guam. I mean, if you did not get your fuel, you were a bad boy. And the only person that could refuel was the aircraft commander. The co-pilot was not trained to refuel. So I sat there and observed and learned <laughs> um, and discovered that he got sweat real sweaty every, every time. And I, I found out later that's exactly what I did too, because wow. it was a lot of work. It wasn't easy to refuel. And then we'd go on in, uh, we'd drop our bombs. Uh, do our mission for Vietnam, and then we would do a training mission afterwards, uh, mm -hmm. do a practice bomb run uh, for the nuclear uh, mission, okay? Not every time, but mm -hmm. a lot of the times, mm -hmm. keep us current on all, of the, all that, and then fly back. So, 24 hours door to door, roughly 23 to 24, from the time we got on the bus to the time we got off. And why did that take so long? Well, the mission was 12 to 13 hours. But then we had briefing before and after. We had, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. You know, we had to pick up survival kits and, you know, just everything. Hmm. So it was a long day. And yeah. then uh, went a second place we went was Okinawa, and uh, that was just the best. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine a better base or experience. It was just beautiful. Okinawa was still a possession at that point of the United States. Um, military all over the, all over the island, and just a really cool place. And it was about an eight-hour mission out of there. Well, no, it was about, I'm sorry, it was about a 12-hour out of there, um, door to door. So I think it was 12 to 14, yeah. Um, something like that. Maybe 12 was right. So uh, same kind of deal. You know, three-ship formation most of the time, pretty much all the time. Um, and you'd be in, you know, never know if you were the lead or the number two or number three. It just varied. Um, and so I did that for over 30 days, about 35, 40 days, something like that. And then, uh, then they sent us over to Utapau, to Thailand, and wrapped it up um, there. And I was gone just six months, I think it was six months, five and a half, six, somewhere in there. And um, the Utapau mission was eight hours door to door. Okay, so eight hours. Um, and the Utapau mission you would fly every day well, with one day off. Hmm. So you'd fly six days and then one day off. The Guam mission, you'd fly every other day. So you, because it was 24 hours, you'd be gone. Then you'd get a whole day off and then back on the schedule. So it was, again, for six days, and then you'd get a break. You, you get, normally the break was a four-day break or something like that, you know. Um, a three-day break, I guess, really. The four-day was a little longer. And so it was, it was a it was intense, you know. And um, basically, all you did was eat, sleep, and fly. <laughs> that was about it, yeah. you know. Um, uh, so that went great. Um, during that time, I, I you know I didn't really communicate at all, hardly with my wife. Um, but I kind of got it in my head that I wanted to try to reconcile this thing. Um, you know, that sounds crazy, but that's just me. Yeah. You know, I. Um, I just felt like I needed to sit down with her and uh, tell her that uh, I still loved her and, you know, was there any way? So I met her at the park where I grew up in Westchester, uh, Westchester Park. Um, 
neutral area out in the grass and we sat down and I made my case. I said, you know, I'm willing if you are. And she said, nope, I'm not willing. I uh, love Bob and, uh, and I never did love you. Hmm. I married you to get out of the house. Oh boy. And, you know, that sounds very painful, but it was, you know, the best thing about it, I've said this to many people, not a lot of people, but some, it was closure. It was wonderful closure. Yeah. And so we, we, we were amiable, we didn't fight, we had this nice chat, and then she laid it out and she said, we're done. I said, great. So that then, I put the wheels in motion for the legal. Uh, California had just changed over to six months interlocutory period, which wasn't that case before. No fault divorce. Mm, okay. And timing was incredible because I it just happened that year, <laughs> earlier that year. So um, I, I was a free man again, you know, and it felt yeah. really good. Although I was really worried about my daughter, sure. but but yeah. you know, um, you know, it was it was a wonderful way to go because it, it ended it, and um, I didn't have to think about any of that anymore except to keep my daughter yeah. <laughs> and pay the child support. Yeah. So, um, then um, I had done well overseas and I uh, got back and one of the other guys who was an instructor pilot uh, talked to my aircraft commander and said, I need a co-pilot, I'd like to have Ken. Wow. Yeah. And this guy was just terrific. All, the, all these guys were great. Th this was a time, I don't know if everybody had that, but I did. These guys, they, they wanted to help me get ahead. They would just, they'll do anything for me. Uh, 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 just to help me get better and grow uh, and move up. And, you know, it was like, it was hard to believe, you know. <laughs> they were just, and this fellow felt the same way. And he said, told me almost right away, you know, went flying with him once, I think. And he said, yeah, well, I want you on my crew. And uh, he said, I'm going to make you an aircraft commander. And I'm sitting there thinking, and I was the first, let's see, how was I first lieutenant? Um, yet, uh, yeah, I was a first lieutenant. And um, anyway, long story short, I loved flying with this guy. He was a real pro. He, yeah, he was an amazing guy. He had, he had every pilot's license, private pilot's license you could have. He had lighter than air, glider, seaplane. <laughs> this guy was the pilot's pilot of all time. Okay. And uh, <laughs> uh, I'll never forget him. And so um, I, you know, I thought, okay, let's do it, you know. And he said, I'm going to train you some of the time. I'm going to put you in this seat, and it's not really authorized. But I'm going to swap seats with you so you can start learning ahead of time, before we formally put you in the upgrade program. <laughs> so I already had, by then, I don't remember how many times we did that, but I had some opportunity. And then he said, I'm going to let you refuel from the right seat. Yeah, which wasn't legal, but... <laughs> but, but that's the way I learned, you know, I mean, he gave me the chance, you know, to have some practice. And he taught me, you know, and, um, and then I formally entered the program, um, the upgrade program, which wasn't a big deal, but it had to be authorized. Yeah, you right, know? yeah. And uh, um, this was in 1971, and um, I was home, so I was home, I got home in September of, of 70, flying, having flown the 42 missions, so I was home now, and I was pulling alert. Uh, we did some alert up at Ellsworth Air Force Base in Rapid City, South Dakota. Incredible experience. We did remote alert. Um, you know, so I was totally into the nuclear mission then because I was here mm -hmm. in the States and uh, that, that was all going on. And, um, and so uh, he said, I'm going to get you upgraded and you're going to be an aircraft commander. Well, as it turned out, I, I, I uh, started the upgrade program and I just went right through it. I mean, it, it was amazing. Um, I didn't have any problems really. Um, yeah, some problems, some just the learning problems of actually doing the whole refueling myself, you know. Uh, but it went well. Um, my check ride, I have to tell this story, it's great. <laughs> uh, my check ride for aircraft commander now, um, this is probably October of 71. And uh, so the check ride is a whole deal. You know, you do the whole mission, you don't do a uh, Vietnam mission, you do a nuclear mission. And so, you know, you take off, it's an eight hour day, take off, refuel, um, do a nav leg, which is pretty long, and then you do some low level, 
and simulating the low level mission and then you come back home and work in the pattern showing them you know that you know this is the check right yeah 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 well get up there for the refueling and uh, the tanker uh, boom operator is on a check right I'm on a check right <laughs> okay now we're over the center of California that's where we always refuel up the San Joaquin Valley and uh, you know everything's going fine and meet up with the tanker and start my approach into we come up from below sort of and we go up towards the boom and we get in a, what they call a pre-contact position okay and you stabilize there so he's ready you're ready you tell him you're ready he says come on in well I start moving forward and of course he has his boom hanging down and as you, he comes in the receptacle is behind me okay I can't see the receptacle yeah. he raises the boom as, he, as you're coming up to him and the boom extends you know he moves in and out and he plugs into the receptacle and then he, you start refueling once you're in contact connected well I start forward and I'm thinking he's gonna move the boom up he never moves the boom up he never moves it it hits the center pane of the window oh, wow. on the airplane and I got the check <laughs> pilot next to me and I didn't do anything wrong this guy was supposed to raise the boom up I don't know what happened still to this day but it cracked the outer pane and we had an emergency instantly I mean you know and you know uh, you, what you did was you called breakaway 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 sort of like you know sort of like if you got hit or something mm -hmm. you know um, when, you, when you call mayday but this yeah. is breakaway yeah. so and that meant the, the the tanker full power climb immediately bomber pull the power back and dive <laughs> you know get away from this yeah. guy yeah, yeah. you know uh, wrecked a mission so so here I am. You know, it it didn't really affect me other yeah. than the fact I knew it wasn't my fault. Yeah. And then yeah. the, the guy that was with me was the top. He was a head check pilot for the squadron at the base, and and he told me right away. He said, "You did nothing wrong." He said, "This, this, this we're going to have to redo your. You know, we got to go burn off fuel and land. We got to get this thing fixed. We don't want the window there. <laughs> you know, that would have been the last thing we wanted. So, so yeah, I had to repeat it, but I passed. Um, and when I passed. I found out, and I didn't really think about it at the time. I was the, I was the youngest aircraft commander at my base ever to become an aircraft commander. Wow! wow. Okay, and I was not, I was not yet a captain. Okay, now if you put it in context of those days of the Strategic Air Command, uh, the norm um, in the earlier days and even up more recently for the aircraft commander was that he was usually always at least a major a lot of times a lieutenant colonel or a colonel and here I am a first lieutenant a silver bar in the left seat wow. it was pretty amazing yeah. didn't last very long because I got my I got promoted in November uh, right after a little while after I took the trip the check ride before I went overseas I think it was the end of November or something like that when I became a captain so and you know in those days it was wartime you know it was if you were doing a good job, it was normal to get pretty quick promotion, you know. So when I left with my own crew um, in January, January 2nd, um, I, I was a captain at that point. But I was a first lieutenant for a little while wow. <laughs> as an aircraft commander. It was pretty wild. I, I couldn't even believe it myself, you know. But again, I, I give a lot of credit to these men that uh, that, that cared about me and that yeah, helped right, me. Right. In, in, uh, so off we went. January second, I had uh, I had a an interesting crew. Uh, my co-pilot had served a year in the backseat of an F four in Vietnam. Uh, he was a reconnaissance backseater. Okay, and they didn't really fly much. I mean, the air the Air Force had to stick in the backseat of the F four. Navy did not, but uh, he had been in combat. Uh, taking photos, uh, reconnaissance, low level, gotten shot at, never got shot down, but gotten shot at a lot. And that was a real plus because it gave me a peace of mind about, you know, hey, I got a guy now who's got combat experience. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and he, he was a good guy. Um, 
Uh, my navigator was green, completely green. Just as green as you can be. <laughs> but really a great kid. And he was a kid to me. I mean, he, you know, he didn't have much experience. And, uh, but he, wa he wanted to get ahead. He wanted to grow. My radar navigator, also known as a bombardier, but not really called that. Um, he was a major. Um, had quite a bit of experience, a lot more years on his, in his, under his belt than I did. Um, good guy. Um, my electronic warfare officer was a lieutenant colonel. Now, with these guys, I mean, would you pull rank on these guys when you were in on the? Oh, on the... I didn't have to pull rank. I was rank. rank. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, they had to do what I said. Okay. The aircraft commander. Okay. Was the boss, you know, just like in an airliner, you know, the captain yeah. is the boss of the whole airplane, yeah. you know. So. And, and you'd mentioned that uh, your radar guy was a kid. I mean, what was your age at this point? How old were you at that? Well, that would have been. Uh, I upgraded in, in seventy one. So. Um, uh, uh, what was I? 20, 23, 24. 20. Yeah. <laughs> Still somewhat of a kid yourself, you know? Oh, yeah. Know. But the point I was trying to get at. Yeah. Yeah. No question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was a kid. Yeah. And, uh, and then my gunner was a, a master sergeant. Uh, another great guy. Really good guy. He sat in the tail. And um, the uh, navigator and the radar navigator sat in the lower level of the B-52. Didn't have any windows. Um, the guy in the tail could see, you know, out. And... Um, and then the electronic warfare officer sat to the rear of where the pilots were, but he was on the upper deck. It was, it was kind of a two-deck deal in, the, in mm -hmm. the front end of the airplane. And he didn't have a window either. Um, so yeah, off we went. And my navigator said, you know, he came to me and he said, uh, I want to do, um, I want to do Celestial the whole way over. And what did they do? They didn't, they didn't fly us over there to start out like I did when I was a co-pilot. We didn't. We didn't take an airplane. I, they flew us over. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, they, they got yeah. us on a tanker. You know, oh, we okay. just we were yeah. just passengers. Yeah. Okay. No, you know, Ken, his <laughs> green aircraft commander, he said, "Okay, you're you're flying an airplane over to Guam." <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm going to Guam, huh? Yeah. By myself? Yep. By myself. So my navigator came. And he says, "I want to do Celestial the whole way." I don't want, and the radar, we had a computer on the airplane. Yeah. It was a, a analog computer, okay? So you didn't really need to, you know, the computer would navigate for you. Yeah. He said, forget it, you know, uh, he can do, he can check me, keep me, on, you know, keep me out of trouble, but I'm going to do a manual, shoot wow. the stars, plotting, you know, three points, uh -huh. triangulation. And I said, oh, great, let's do it. That'll make it really even more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, out, off we went and uh, took off out of uh, March and went up to Northern California and headed, headed towards Guam and, and hit the tanker a little ways off the coast, probably a couple hundred miles off the coast and uh, topped it off and uh, we were on our way. And um, it, was, it, was a, it was a lot of quiet time up there. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, we weren't going to be close to anything, you know. Uh, wow. No, you know, we did have to, those days they had some ships. We did have to report to the ship, which, you know, they used to have ships anchored out in the ocean. That's what these guys did was monitor the air traffic. Uh, they kind of kept track of you. Yeah. That was it. So we get to get close to Guam and, uh, you know, we're talking, you know, inside the airplane and the navigator says, I think, I think we're going to be pretty much right where I want to be. Well, uh, sure enough, uh, when they got the, the island and the radar, and I couldn't even see it yet, but shortly thereafter I could see it. We were mu one mile off. Really? Oh, wow. One mile <laughs> after plotting right. the whole thing manually right. and shooting the stars every, what, every half hour, I think it was. He would triangulate, you know, he'd take, take a fix. So it was much like sailing in a boat. Yeah, right, know? yeah. Well, I was so impressed. And he was so, you know, he was so pumped after that. I mean, he needed that, too. Yeah, he needed yeah. to be able to prove yeah. that he was good, you know. And uh, it just started us off on a great footing. And uh, took that airplane into Guam and landed. And, of course, I had been there before. And, uh, and uh, started, started working, started, started our missions. And um, again, most of the time, three ship formation in those days, uh, three ship launch and 
refueling. Um, refueling is you go into echelon, you know, so you got one, two, three, and you'd all hit the tankers and you'd be on the same frequency and you better get your fuel or everybody's going to know you're a loser. <laughs> a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. All on the aircraft command. Uh, yeah, sure. So we started our missions and uh, things were going well. Um, we got an award for uh, what they call DASC. Um, that's an acronym. You, you know, military loves acronyms. Uh, so, and DASC is Drift Angle Station Keeping. Okay, what does that mean? That means you got three airplanes. One, two, normally on the right side, and three, normally on the left side. A mile distance between one, two, and three. Okay, a mile is all. And 500 foot separation. Okay, so you got one, two, three. Okay, so. The idea was you have a drift angle because you have winds. So you have to counter that. So you have to point the airplanes into the wind or keep a track that has um, this drift angle station keeping. So you're, you're keeping this accuracy of distance between everybody. Why, why were we doing that? Well, we were, and it would be tracked on radar, recorded, uh -huh. and they'd evaluate it when you got back. They were doing that because they wanted three lines of bombs, okay? The line of bombs would be roughly a football field, okay? It could be a little bigger than that, but... And roughly a football field wide, each one of them. Okay, so if you had three lines of a football field all at the same point releasing, then you, you obliterated a pretty giant area, yeah. if you can imagine, right. like a football stadium, right. you know, and you got three of these, you've really, you've just really destroyed a lot of stuff. And so we got an award for that, um, called a perfect desk. I think I still have it, actually. <laughs> um, maybe not. I think I maybe gave that to the Air Force Museum. Anyway, so um, we were doing well, and um, we had some high threat missions. Um, one up north against the Mugia Pass, where the that was a place where the trucks would come out of North Vietnam and head south. And this one mission was in the middle of the night, and uh, we flew, of course, around the clock. You know, they, that's the other thing. All these missions, as I mentioned, they would they would accelerate around the clock by about normally about three hour increments. So when you were flying day after day after day, you're you know you okay. move forward yeah. on the schedule. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that's the way it worked. Um, so we, we, um, we got up towards North Vietnam. We were coming in over Laos. Um, we, weren't, we were actually way north, in, um, up near, not far from China. Mm. And, um, and it was a high threat target because it was a Mugia Pass and it wasn't really, we weren't expecting a lot of uh, interference from you know, any kind of thing like surface to air missiles or anything like that. But we're going along and we hadn't gotten to the IP. The IP is the initial point where you start your bomb run. Still, everybody's still pretty relaxed. You're just on your way, and, and uh, we're on our way in. And I, I'm looking out there, and you know, I start seeing these look like muzzle flashes, you know. And so I said to my co-pilot, I said, "Hey, Terry," and I had run my seat up. Our seats went up and down. We could, you know, we could move them mm -hmm. up and down. I looked down and said, "Terry, what are those muzzle flashes?" And uh, Terry raised his seat up, and he goes, "Oh," he says, uh, "They're firing at us." I said, "What?" That was the first time I, I realized that this is a war. Wow. Because wow, the yeah, other times yeah. when I was over as a co-pilot, yeah, yeah. you know. And I said, they're shooting at us? He said, I wouldn't worry about it. He says, those are 100 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. He said, they only, they only go up to about 25,000. So we're and, about... And what are you guys flying at? About, about 28, 29. Okay. Yeah. He said, I, I wouldn't worry about it. But he said, yeah, they're shooting at us. <laughs> of course, he knew because he'd been yeah, there. Yeah, right. And I just all of a sudden went, wow, you know, okay, this is real. This is not practice. It just really hit me. Still to this day, I, yeah. I reflect on that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, in we went, we did our run and everything was fine. And um, so we're fast forward to April of 1972. Um, we're well into our time now. We left January 2nd, so. Um, they, uh, I was number two um, in a three ship. 
Um, the the flag color, uh, the name was, we used color, they used colors. So they, these were randomly assigned by computer, you know. So we were Aqua, hmm. Aqua 2. And this was a high threat mission, okay. Brief that way and really high threat. Okay, so to the extent that we had, um, we had a lot of protection. Um, we had, uh, and they had started flying up north, okay, from the south. Okay, so now we were, we were crossing the border uh, into North Vietnam, um, bombing. We were at, this target was an airfield, it was the Vin airfield, V-I-N-H. And, and it wasn't just us, it was just, they were, that's what they were doing. Yeah. And so, high threat mission, what did that mean? That meant um, electronic war warfare below, underneath us, uh, fighters up above, cover for against MiGs mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, just a lot of a lot of kind of a a big big mission. It wasn't right. just us, yeah, yeah, yeah. but we were the focal point because we were going to drop the bombs. So there was a lot of protection for us. Um, and we flew, we were flying out of Thailand, out of Utapau, which as you may remember from earlier in this I said that was an eight hour mission. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there we were. Uh, we got we got to the uh, closer to the target. We were up in the north, and we started getting all kinds of signals. You know, all the uplink, what they call uplink radar, which is the radar for the SAMs, and where they try to find you. Um, and normally, what they would do, they would target. This was later they, we found this out, but they would target the number one airplane because they they knew that's the guy that's got to be where he should be. So he's, he's going to be the one to follow, mm -hmm. and then they'd hope to hit two or three, see. Uh, they wouldn't really be aiming to hit him. He was mainly just going to give them the guidance so that they could get one of the other guys. And this continued. So we're up there, and, um, it, you know, everything started happening, and we started getting all these uplink signals, and we started hearing some of the other airplanes uh, calling uh, miss missile sightings, you know, um, and there, I think it changed later, but at that point in time, they were not normally trying to hit you before you hit the target, uh, before you released. Um, so we went in and um, did our release, and we were already getting a lot of uplink radar, and, but we weren't really seeing anything at that point, um, as I remember. But uh, we did our release, and, and man, it just, everything hit the fan. Oh, wow. Everything hit the fan. I mean, they, you know, then we started seeing missiles, you know. Oh. I mean, they just started launching at us. And so we immediately, I mean, we just got the bombs off, and um, I don't even remember the exact sequence, but who said what, whether the lead told us or whether, I don't even remember that part, it's funny. But we started our evasive maneuvers, okay? So essentially what that was, was now, you remember we have the three ships, mm -hmm. okay? And they're flying an echelon like this. So the evasive maneuvers was where you, you forgot about the formation, okay? You were no longer concerned about the formation. What you had to do was perform the evasive maneuver. And the, the, Lead would go one direction, and you would go, I was number two, aqua two. So we would go the other direction, and then the th number three would go the other direction from us. So you, now you've got three airplanes all doing this kind of this scissor thing. With it. But what it was, was it was, um, it was a 45 degree bank, okay, angle, which is pretty steep. Yeah. Uh, we do steep turns at 45 degrees, you know. Now you never do that in a commercial yeah. airliner. Um, 45 degrees of bank, um, climbing and descending, over a thousand feet above and below the base altitude. Okay, so climbing and descending and 45 degrees of bank going 30 degrees to the left off of the main heading and then coming back to 30 degrees to the right off of the main heading and just keep this up. So you're, uh, you're up and down, can you picture it? Yeah. You're, you're just all over the place. So the idea is make it very difficult for them to hit you and fool the missus. See. So we're doing the evasive maneuvers, and uh, we're on our own at that, see. We're not part of the formation anymore. We are, but yeah, yeah. You know, we're just on our own. So I start out to the right, um, and number one goes to the left, and we get over to 30 degrees, and we're going up and down, and, and, I, 
and I come back to the left, and of course now we're seeing missiles, and we're calling, you know, we're hearing other guys call them out. Wow! And uh, and then so I go right, left, right. Now I'm coming back to the left again, okay? And um, I get 30 degrees off and begin my turn back. And as I remember, I was climbing, and I roll into about 30 degrees of bank. And when I hit about 30 degrees, um, this missile that hit us was coming up and so you know the missile is trying to track you lock on they lock on you with radar uh, they literally lock on and there's an uplink radar and then there's a, a lock on radar that that you you become the target and it's locked into the missiles computer see so that it hits you <laughs> well it's not set up to deal with the <laughs> maneuver see so i'm coming now back the missile's coming up and I hit 30 degrees of bank, and here's the missile, and he's he's going, and he's almost got like a brain to some degree. He's thinking, uh-oh, I'm not going to hit him because he's just turning back. So I'm going to have to try to hit him, so I'll go over the top like this, what they call an apogee, you know. And the missile's fused three ways. Direct hit, obviously, blows up. Proximity fuse, what is that? A metal sensing device, okay, senses the metal of the airplane, blows up. Uh, the other is a button on the ground. <laughs> I don't know that they ever used that. Yeah, yeah. So, missiles right here, right off of the left wing. Picture the wing like this. Uh, metal sensing device says blow up. Okay, the missile's known to have a conical spray of shrapnel. The high explosive comes off the nose of the missile. And the missile blew. And um, so, in the airplane, um, huge flash, okay, like huge, like, and huge, um, just a huge explosion, okay, oh. boom, you know, just as big as you can imagine. And so it was crazy, you know. Um, so then the first thing you do is, the first thing I did was, um, and I didn't have this plan. I mean, it's just what happened. Um, first thing is, well, am I still here? Of course, rapid decompression, fog in the cockpit. Um, we were on oxygen. You know, we were all in, ready to go. Um, so, um, am I still here? Yep. Looking at myself. Yep, I'm still here. Okay. Second thing you learned: um, fly the airplane. Always fly hmm. wow. the airplane. Okay. Training. Training key in so many things in life. People don't realize how important training is because you learn ahead of time what to do. And if you take it to heart, you're going to do the right thing. So fly the airplane. I'm, I've got my hands on the controls when this happens. See, I've got my hand yeah, on the yeah. throttles. I got my hand on the yoke. I'm flying. I'm manually flying the airplane. Okay. Am I still flying? Yes. Okay. Then I could go, okay, now we're going to assess the damage. Okay. One of the things in the flight manual, probably still there today, uh, the beginning of the emergency procedures section of every flight manual had three things. Stop, think, collect your wits. Okay, very important. That's what you had to do then. Okay, I had to stop. Okay, I'm alive, I'm here, I'm flying. Yes, the airplane is still flying. <laughs> I don't have to say bail out, you know, not yet anyway, I hope. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then, so then we stop, think, collect your wits. We, that's what we began to do. Okay. Let's assess the damage. You know, I'm talking to my co-pilot. Okay, what's happening? Downstairs, they're telling me they're covered with fuel. Fuel's leaking into the into the crew compartment, into the where the radar is. I tell them to turn everything off. I mean, get, well, actually, before I did that, I got a crew check. Everybody okay? Everybody checks in? Nobody hurt? Uh, Nobody's yeah. hurt. Wow. Yeah, checked in with everybody. That's the first thing, too. Um, then begin to assess the damage. Okay, so, and then beyond that, um, since I was flying the airplane, uh, uh, we call Mayday, of course. I call Mayday as soon as it happened, three times. Uh, you, you say it three times, and then I, I call it twice, you know. Mayday, 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 Aqua 2, uh, we're hit. And, um, and, and then we began to turn uh, towards, towards the ocean, you know, because going back to what I said earlier, I didn't want to bail out <laughs> if I didn't have to. And if I had to bail out, I wanted to bail out over the ocean, okay, because then I'd get picked up, you know, and the crew would get picked up. Were you pretty deep in the north? Uh, yeah, north not real far from the ocean, but yeah. uh, then was sort of just inland from the coast. So, 
we weren't that far, yeah, you know. Yeah. But if you know, if I had to bail out right then, I was done. I yeah, was going to yeah. land in North Vietnam, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. or even later, you know. So um, you know, for, head for the ocean. So that's what I thought of right away. And uh, to this day, I don't know where number one went. I, I lost him completely. Um, number three stayed with me um, somehow, um, or caught up to me, because you know we were all over mm -hmm, the place. Mm -hmm. um, and so we headed towards the ocean and, you know, began to continue to assess the, the damage and um, start a slow descent. And um, it's hard to remember some of the details, sure, how we, how we yeah. decided yeah. to go to Da Nang, but uh, we knew that, um, that we had, to, I, I knew we had to get this thing on the ground because I, I know that the, the fuel, we had what appeared to be one engine out completely. Uh, we didn't know anything about the fuel all the fuel gauges were just yeah. i mean they weren't dead but they yeah. we we knew they weren't yeah. accurate anymore. right right and uh so we had no clue i mean the myriad of things going through my mind yeah. was unbelievable because you know okay i don't know how much fuel we have i don't know how long we can stay in the air i don't know if the gear is going to come down i don't know if the tires got yeah. damaged yeah. i don't know if the flaps are going to come down i don't know if we're going to get on fire yeah. you know how was the actual control of the plane? Were you still... Was oh, it was okay. Okay. It was okay. Um, I let the airspeed get way too high <laughs> in the descent. I think it was another blessing, if, if you can call it that. Um, this is my own assessment. Yeah. I think it was the thing that prevented us from getting any fire. Because I think it sucked a lot of the fuel away from okay. where there could have been problems you know, a lot more problems, and it, it was just amazing that, um, you know, I, I don't know, it, it, was, it was really strange that uh, that happened, but I got up to almost to the maximum airspeed the airplane was supposed to have when I realized hmm. as I was, and I wasn't steeply descending, yeah. I just let her go, trying to and all of a sudden I realized, and I went, whoa, you know, we're going way too fast. And I could, because the sound level went way up too. So. I, I think it was one of those weird things that just happened, and I couldn't put my finger on it. I can't, still can't today, hmm. but I think it saved our bacon. Wow. That way. So anyway, we get down towards the name. And this is a, a little before 7 in the morning when we got hit. Um, just getting light. Um, and we decided, decided somehow we decided Denang is where we're going. And I, we did know that the only B-52 that had gone in there uh, several years before for mechanical problem had run off the end of the runway. Um, not a good thing to think about at that point. But we didn't have a choice. Yeah, wow. I had to get it on the ground, you know, because I knew the fuel was... These guys got soaked in jet fuel downstairs. And everybody had windows now. Um, the the uh, Everybody had holes they could look out of. Uh, the electronic warfare officer had a window next to his, he was leaning forward, he leans back, he goes, oh, there's a hole <laughs> in the skin. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. So, get down into the pattern and um, start our descent and in, into the local area and call the Da Nang Tower, you know, and, uh, you know, we're totally VFR. I mean, we're trying to be, you know, just navigate on our own. Yeah. I mean. And so we call the tower, we get in the local area, and of course they see us, you know, on the radar and stuff. And uh, they didn't really tell us, well, they did tell us the field conditions. I mean, the, 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 they were in the weather, it was IFR, you know, low ceiling, Jeez. you know. Uh, we, get, we get on downwind, okay, now they, they've got us lined up, they're giving us directions. They got us on downwind, and uh, when we contact the, guy, the radar guy on the ground, the approach control, he says, uh, be advised your number six in emergency in the pattern. Your number six emergency in the pattern for Da Nang, okay? So that means there's five other airplanes, all with emergency squawks. You know, emergency would be 777 on the identification friend or foe, the, uh -huh. the identity device. Yeah. Shows up as a big blip on the radar screen. <laughs> number six, okay? So there we are. Yeah, think about all those things too. Okay, is the gear going to come down? Well, the gear comes down, but the tire is going to be blown. You know, yeah, is the chute right. going to work? Because yeah. we had a drag chute, we had pretty much had to use it. 
uh, all the time. We use it all the time, but um, uh, yeah, the flap's going to come down. So that that went through all that stuff, and um, finally, finally, it took us out, out on this incredible extended downwind, you know, with all these other emergencies ahead of us. Um, finally, turn us base. Finally, turn us to the final approach heading, and um, so we're in the weather. IFR can't see anything. Um, driving in towards the landing, you know, and uh, we get about. I don't know, five, six miles out, and uh, the, uh, the tower comes over guard and says, be, be advised, uh, all aircraft in the pattern for Da Nang, we are now getting small arms fire on short final. Oh, okay, short final is just, you know, the area right off the end of the runway, and there's some guys down there shooting <laughs> with small arms at the airplanes. It was like, what? What next? You know? So all this stuff's going on, and um, we didn't have any problem with that. I mean, we didn't see anything. We broke out at about 1,200 feet. You know, uh, it's kind of a classic day. You know, it was raining, uh, not heavily. Everything was wet. You know, the runway was. You see the runway. We're lined up. Uh, you know, it, it, it was gray, kind of a day. And of course, then I'm thinking, okay, do we have tires? Um, Will the chute come out was the big thing, because it's only a 10,000 foot runway, see. And we would normally need 12 for takeoff, mm -hmm. and landing wasn't so critical. So I end up coming in a little bit hot, and uh, we bounced a little bit, which is really rare for me, but uh, I was pretty shook up. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> and, uh, you know, bounce a little bit once, and then settle back and, and uh, put it on the ground. And, and, and I, the aircraft commander controlled the chute. And, so I pulled the chute, and the gunner, of course, sitting back there, he didn't see it. And, uh, and he called right away and said, good shoot. And I went, oh, okay. Because <laughs> you need, I needed that shoot because yeah, of wet yeah. runway and all that, yeah. you know, and I didn't know what would happen otherwise. So, so, and immediately then we're on the rollout, and we got plenty of room before, you know, we got to the end. We actually stopped well before. And so we kind of had to taxi a little ways on the runway. And, of course, I had my co-pilot looking for how, where are we going to park? <laughs> it was so stupid at the time. <laughs> I just, you know, we were just doing our normal thing, you know. And, and he said, I think the taxiways are too narrow. They're only 100 feet. You know, we needed 150. Uh -oh. And I said, well, where are they going to park us? And with that, then the, what they call the deputy commander of operations, that's the guy that basically is assigned to running the whole airfield at any Air Force base. It's called the DCO. He comes up on guard and says, uh, pull that airplane onto the apron and shut it down immediately. You know, I mean, emphatically says this over guard on the radio. And we just were just, you know, we were just kind of doing our stuff. You know, we weren't even realizing. Um, so I pull onto the apron at the end of the runway. Okay, there's a big apron where you, the airplanes can wait to take <laughs> off and everything. And uh, he's coming in his car. I see him with the light on and everything. And then I see the fire trucks. And they're all coming. And... Uh, pull the airplane plane over and and um, and shut it down, you know, and tell the crew to abandon aircraft, you know. Um, it's just like a ship, you yeah. know, and the last guy to go is yeah. me, and I have to make sure everybody's off, you know, safely. So they all got off, and they all got out by the side of the airplane, and and um, and I'm still sitting in there, and um, <laughs> sat there for. Probably not very long, but it seemed like I sat there for a little bit, and I was just going, whoa, I can't believe we made it. I didn't even have a clue then. I knew it was bad, but I didn't know how bad. So then I get out, and um, I walk over to where they're standing alongside the airplane, and um, I look back at that thing, and, you know, the fire trucks are already starting to, they, they weren't foaming at that time. I don't even know if they had foam. They were hosing it down, you know. And the fuel was just running out of the bottom of the airplane, all over the place. It was like the the picture in my mind is like the, the airplane is just peeing, like it has to really pee, wow. you know, like a human. Jeez. When you really have to go, yeah. it's running out that strong. Oh, man. So, you know, I look at that and I just go, I don't, you know, wow. Well, we didn't stay there very long because there was operations going on. You know, we stood out there for a little while till they could get a bus over to pick us up. But um, um, watched a couple fighters go off, and you know that was kind of fun. <laughs> but 
But uh, my, my co-pilot had flown with a squadron called the Triple Nickel, 555th a Tactical Fighter Squadron, or Tactical Recce Squadron, I think it was. And the 555th had, had a base there at Diné. And so Terry said, um, he asked the DCO, I think, hey, can, you know, can we get a hold of the th somebody at the 555th and have them come pick us up or whatever? And he said, sure, no problem. And he said, well, I used to be in that squadron. And he said, I think they'd probably be happy to help us out, have, take care of us for a while today. So they did. They were just awesome, you know. Uh, and uh, we walked into their, you know, boy, those were the days. Um, you walk into this kind of, their hooch, uh -huh, call it. Uh -huh. It was like a, it was where they hung out, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was like a bar. Uh -huh. um, and so you walk in and you see all of these strings going across the room and they're all connected to a bell and they all have you know we used to have a, we used to carry a survival knife right here uh -huh. and you'd rip the survival knife pocket off and they put the survival knife pocket up on these strings and anywhere in the bar see there was a lot of rules in those days like if you wore a hat into the bar you forgot to take your hat off you had to you know they would ring the bell uh -huh. so they had it so everybody in the place could always reach the thing to ring the bell. <laughs> and then you bought the whole house the oh, right. drinks. Yeah. Okay. So bing. You know. <laughs> so we walk in and here's all these things hanging down. I'd never been in one at that <laughs> point. You know, this is really weird, you know. And they brought us some beers and so we and it was like quarter to eight in the morning and we're having beer, you know. Uh, maybe it was eight, eight thirty, yeah. I don't know. Um, and then they, they took us, you know, to eat. They took care of us for most of the whole day. We just we, we just had to wait. We had to be picked up. And they sent a tanker over over to uh, to Da Nang from Utapau to pick us up, and, uh, and it took us back, it took us back to uh, Utapau. Um, and I remember walking in my room. Um, we were housed in, in trailers at Thailand, and uh, the the aircraft commanders had uh, just a two man trailer. It was a it was a Tiny little. It wasn't a very big trailer, but you had your room on one side, your your partner's room. You didn't really know him yeah. necessarily. On the other side, with a bathroom in the middle, and you had bunks. But it was just the, the aircraft commanders. They let them be by themselves, which was great. But I remember walking in there and and just going, I, I might not. I remember opening some of my drawers on my dresser and saying somebody else might have been getting my stuff. Yeah, right. Oh, I mean, that's yeah. what hit me. You yeah, know? oh, yeah. It yeah. just was strange. Yeah, it... it was just really bizarre, you know? Oh, and and uh, I was just pinching myself that I was still alive, that we'd made it, you know? It was like... So then I get a call, or I get somebody comes to, to the, to the uh, trailer and knocks on the door and says, uh, the Deputy Commander of Operations at Utapau, he wants to see you in his office at 7 o'clock tonight. And he doesn't want your crew, he just wants you. And I said, okay, I'll be there. So, you know, I had to put my uniform on and, you know, because I was just hanging out at that point, um, probably thinking about going to bed. <laughs> um, so I get my uniform on and go over to, uh, to the offices and uh, walk in. Of course, everybody's gone. You know, it's just like here. I mean, yeah. work day's over and they right, work yeah. a regular day, yeah. most of them. Uh, and nobody there. And find his office and knock on the door, you know. And he says, come in, and you know, classic military, you know, thing. I walk in, you know, go to the front of his desk, Captain Curry reporting, sir. <laughs> he says, be at, you know, be at ease, have a seat. And he's got a red notebook on his desk. And I knew that a red notebook was at least top secret, you know, if anything that was top secret or higher or, you know, was always in a red notebook. And, um, yeah, I noticed that right away because it was right in the center of his desk. And uh, so he's, he starts talking to me. He says, well, um, we've, we've done a quick assessment uh, of your airplane. Uh, after you landed, we, we did a quick look at it. Uh, you got 60 major holes in the airplane. And I sat there and I thought, okay. I don't know what a major hole is. So I said to him, I said, what, what is a major hole? And he goes, oh, it's a, a hole that's four inches in diameter or larger. You have 60 holes. I said, are you, really? He goes, yep. He said, I think you're going to get the Silver Star. 
Well, that was a little over the top for me, honestly. I mean, I, I wasn't looking for decorations. Yeah, right, right. I mean, that was about the last thing I was thinking of. And I don't know where he got that from. Silver Star's pretty high up. <laughs> and I said, really? And he says, yeah, we're going to see. We're gonna, we'll see. We'll see. Um, but he said, I think you deserve it. I said, well, thank you, sir. You know, and we talked for a few minutes, and then he, then he opens up. He said, there's one other thing I want to tell you. We, I wasn't in there very long. And he said, there's one other thing I want to tell you. With that, he opens the red notebook. You know? I go, yes, sir. He says, uh, let me read something to you. Let me read a name to you. And uh, he reads this Russian name. You know? And I said, okay. And he said, uh, he was in the site that fired the missile that, you, that hit you. He is a Soviet advisor, and there must have been a mole, see? Yeah, right. Because wow. he's already got it on his desk. Wow. This, is only, this is only 12 hours later, wow. right? So that's the yeah. level of, you know, yeah. it's, it's even greater today, the level of intelligence, you know. Yeah, it's right. Pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. His name. So, you know, he told me, he said, I just want you to know that because th this, this whole event was orchestrated by the Soviet Union and by their advisors. That's why he got hit. You know, at least that's what we think. <laughs> you know, it wasn't just the the gooks as they yeah, called them. Yeah. You know, just trying to you know do their thing. He said, no, they had people right there that knew exactly how to do it. You know, so anyway, he left me with that, and uh, we went on about about our business, and we uh, we got uh, twenty four hours off. And we're back on the schedule. Well, what was it like? I mean, up to this point, you had to have been living on adrenaline big time. Now you finally get back to your, your trailer and you're laying in your bunk and there's quiet and you can finally decompress. I yeah. mean, were you able to... Yeah. Yeah, I was really tired. Man. Yeah. I was just really tired. And, you know, I loved being this. You know, I loved it that I didn't have to be with somebody else in the room. Yeah. You know, it was really great. The other guys did. They had a room with people, you know. Uh, my navigator and my uh, um, co-pilot room together, and the radar and the, the electronic warfare officer room together. You know, they had bunks, but it was nice just to be alone. But yeah, um, yeah, I decompressed, and but I was back on the schedule the next, you know, 24 hours later. And guess what? We went right back up north again. Oh, jeez. Yeah, wow. we did. We did well. You know, part of that was good. I wasn't upset with that. I mean, part of it was, you know, you had getting to, back on the horse type of well, you mentality, had face, or you had to face reality. Yeah, you know, it's not over. It's not over. You got to get back in there. You got to do your job. You know, and, and we did it.